Wittgenstein, 9-8. Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Creating the Right Animal Program to Facilitate Quality Animal Studies, the ALAC International Perspective. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Let's get started. This presentation has been approved for continuing educational credits. If you want to obtain the credits, please click on the Get Your Free CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of our speakers and presentations. Please select the CE button under the presentation and follow the instructions to claim your certificate. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speaker, Javier Guillen, DVM, Senior Director for Europe and Latin America for ALAC International. Dr. Guillen obtained his veterinary medicine degree at the University of Zaragoza in Spain and was for 17 years director of the laboratory animal services at the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. In parallel between 2003 and 2008, he was also a member of the Association for Assessment and Accreditation of Lab Laboratory Animal Care ALAC International Council on Accreditation. Dr. Guillen is a member of the Ethics Committee of the University of Navarra since its creation in 1997, now serving as an external member. In 2008, he joined ALAC International as Senior Director and Director of European Activities. Since 2013, he is Senior Director for Europe and Latin America. Dr. Guillen was affiliated with the Federation of European Laboratory Animal Science Associations, first as secretary from 2002 to 2008, later as president from 2009 to 2010. Since 2011, he is a member of the E-Class Governing Board. For Dr. Guillen's complete bio, please visit the LabRoots website. Dr. Guillen will now begin his presentation. Thank you, Judy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to this presentation titled Creating the Right Animal Program to Facilitate Quality Animal Studies, the ALAC International Perspective. During the first part of this presentation, I will give, uh, let's say, basic remarks and concepts on how to create uh, an animal program and what we in ALAC understand by it by an animal care and use program. The second part, which will be longer, will be focused on uh, the ALAC International perspective on certain areas of an animal care and use program. And this perspective will be given based on the typical findings that we uh, identify during ALAC site visits across the globe. We will also comment and discuss some of the expectations ALAC has to address some of those findings. We all know that uh, there are a number of factors that may affect uh, the well-being and therefore the quality of the research uh, produced from these animals. Some of them may be intrinsic, like their genetics. Others may be, uh, depending on the environment, micro and macro environment, how the husbandry practices are performed, uh, the health status of the animals, how the experimental procedures are conducted, on uh, how they may uh, uh, have some pain and distress implications in the animals. All these factors, we all know that may have some impact on the animal well-being and therefore on the quality of the science. Assuming, as we do, that there is a correlation between animal well-being and the quality of science. But there are also other elements that will impact how the other factors listed in the previous slide affect the animals. The main one is related to personnel. Personnel should have 
well-defined responsibilities and authority and appropriate training and competence. And when we are talking about personnel, we uh, should be considering all personnel working with animals, the research team, veterinarians, all type of animal care personnel at any level, and also especially personnel uh, working at institutional animal care and use committees or similar oversight bodies, however or whatever they are called in different areas of the world. And this in the context of certain type of facilities, equipment and resources, all together will uh, determine how the other factors will affect animal well-being and therefore quality of science. And when we talk about all these factors, in, in summary, we are talking about an animal care and use program, which is the essential com concept that we are going to, uh, to discuss during this presentation. We have to take all these uh, elements as a whole, including in an animal care and use program. We have to deal with the concept of a program that based on the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals, which is one of the ALAC international primary standards, can be defined as the mean, as uh, means the policies, procedures, standards, organizational structure, staffing facilities, and practices put into place by an institution to achieve the human care and use of animals in the laboratory and throughout the institution. That's a very important concept because even though many of you may be well aware of what ALAC means and maybe familiar with what ALAC does in practice. There are still some people who think that ALAC International accredits buildings or facilities and that's not true. What we accredit and what we evaluate are animal care and use programs including all these things. And going more into detail of the areas that institutions we, uh, having the accreditation or, or uh, willing to obtain it have to define and what we later we will evaluate. The first big area uh, called Animal Care and Use Program itself uh, include some um, uh, points or elements corresponding to the program management, especially for example the, some personal important responsibilities within the institution such as the institutional official, that person within the institution with enough authority and resources to implement a big change if needed in the program. The attending veterinarian, or called also designated veterinarian in the European Union. And several key issues concerning personal management, uh, training and education, and I would say also competence of all personnel involved in the program Another important issue, occupational health and safety of personnel, and all aspects related to the ethical review process. Normally in US terms, that's related to the IACUC. In other areas of the world, this is uh, related to other type of oversight bodies. They can be called ethic, ethics committees, animal welfare bodies. There may be a combination of several bodies or persons involved in this program oversight, how these bodies are composed, how they perform the protocol review, etc., etc. The second big chapter that we evaluate and, that, uh, and, and is one of the important elements of an animal care and use program is everything concerning the animal environment, housing and management. For example, uh, all environmental conditions, temperature, temperature, humidity, ventilation, etc., and not only for terrestrial animals, but for example, also for aquatics, which is important. Concerning uh, housing, we will pay attention to the primary enclosures and one of the most, let's say, hot topics, especially in the past years, concerning enrich environmental enrichment and social and behavioral management and also the, let's say, the daily routines that the faci uh, concerning facility management relating to husbandry and also population management. This would be like the second big area that we evaluate and that has to be considered by anybody or any institution willing to construct, to build up uh, a comprehensive animal care and use program. The third big area concerns veterinary care. Since the moment animals are obtained to the moments 
till, till the moment animals are killed or maybthe rehomed if, they, if euthanasia has not been the end of the experiments. Animal procurement and transportation, everything relating to preventive medicine, to uh, clinical care and management. If there are surgical programs within the institution, everything concerning planning, facilities, aseptic technique, etc. And of course, how pain distress are managed, how anesthesia and analgesia are um, given and provided to animals and how animals are killed at the end of the experiment. The fourth big chapter is the physical plan, the facility itself. And this is very important for those who are not familiar with ALAC, because as you can see, physical plan is, let's say, one of only, only one of the four big areas that are needed to build up a, reasonable, a reasonably good animal care and use program. Location, construction guidelines, functional areas and operations concerning uh, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, power and lighting, malfunctions, storage areas, sanitizing facilities, any other, any kind of other special facilities uh, that may be relating to specialized housing. Uh, there may be surgical um, areas, there may be imaging areas, any other of special facilities, and a little bit also of security and access control. So what is the first step if we want to either improve our animal care and use program or start building up a new one? Review all these areas in a systematic way. Use your eyes, use your uh, time, use your brain and do it in a systematic manner. That's extremely important. And review what are you doing in your institution uh, concerning the uh, structure and organization of the program, uh, anything related to the ethical review process, to the training uh, of personnel, to occupational health and safety, to all, everything related to relating to husbandry and daily routines, how experiments are conducted uh, by researchers, everything concerning the, the environment of the animals, physical enrichment, etc. The veterinary care and the physical plant and equipment. The first step absolutely needed is to review this, all these areas in a systematic way. And from ALAC, we can offer you a free tool to do this. Of course, a number of you will be familiar already with this if you uh, belong to an accredited institution uh, or are, let's say, going for it and you have already downloaded this document. But for those of you who are not familiar yet with the ALAC accreditation process, I think it is interesting for you to know that uh, within the ALAC website, you have the uh, opportunity to uh, download, if you wish, uh, for free, the program description. The program description is the template used uh, by ALAC to first evaluate the animal care and use programs before going to the institution to do the site visit. And uh, this is a very useful document because it asks questions on all these areas, very detailed questions. It is a document that any institution, any individual can download for free, uh, review it, and and perform a gap analysis because when reading those questions, one may realize which areas may need more attention or, or which issues should be corrected or which act action should be implemented to uh, have a program ready. The second step, engage key personnel. Um, Representatives from management, research team, uh, veterinarians and animal care personnel, IACUC or any, any other person involved in uh, the ethical review process, people involved also on the occupational health and safety, maintenance people, and if there is a quality assurance unit in the institution, normally they uh, uh, help a lot. The, uh, their help is extremely useful in some institutions because they are very used to, to make things in a systematic manner. So if you belong to um, a program, you are a veterinarian or you are someone in uh, a technician or someone willing to uh, 
build up and to promote a program, if you have a quality assurance unit, they, they normally are of good help. I know that you, some of you may be thinking um, that you have tried, that it is difficult, your institution is quite complex, this is difficult, and I perfectly understand that some of you may feel like this when trying this. I perfectly understand that. But we have to try. We have to try, and it is an essential step because without the help of representatives from these groups of people, you will not have success in creating or establishing a good program at your institution. And the third step, once you have been so lucky and successful that you have engaged the key individuals, you should establish a project with milestones, with a defined coordination, and with a defined leadership. And once you have those things, then you start going the way. I know, I know some of you may be thinking that it is, this is more easily said than done, and it is entirely true, but um, you have to do, uh, to give the first step. So now um, we are going to enter in the ALAC perspective based on the experience of more than uh, 950 animal care and use programs that we have accredited in 41 countries, which is a good experience. And I'm going to summarize the, let's say, the most typical findings that we may identify in institutions that may need or, the, or that may warrant a suggestion uh, from our side. Uh, that we tell the institution that they should or must correct to improve their program. And we will comment it, we will comment these findings along with the expectations, with the expectations we have for some of these particular issues. And the first area relates to the institutional considerations. There are uh, in the structure of the institution, which is something that we evaluate that the institutions have to uh, describe to us and that we will evaluate. There are uh, three, key, three key elements. One is the institutional official. One is the, uh, I mean, we have defined already the institutional official as the person at the institution with, uh, with enough power and authority. That normally the person to whom both the IACUCOR equivalent and the attending or designated veterinarian reports report to. That's one key uh, person, in our opinion, at the institution. The other one is the attending or designated veterinarian. The other one, it is the body or bodies or persons in charge of the ethical review process. And what we see sometimes is that uh, we see fails, uh, gaps in the way of how things are reported, for, for example, from IACUC or other oversight bodies to the institutional official, and in other cases, even though that reporting is, is performed, uh, that the institutional official is not giving is not giving the necessary authority or resources to the IACUC or oversight body. The same, exactly the same, might apply to the connection between the institutional official and the attending veterinarian. And that we, and that case is, let's say, relatively uh, often seen in some institutions. And also, and very important, we will have to see if there is the necessary and appropriate needed and essential collaboration between the attending veterinarian and the area cook, which is something that doesn't happen all the time. Also within this uh, area of institutional uh, consideration, we will have to pay attention to some of the institutional responsibilities such as the training of personnel, the documentation, or the disaster plan. And going more into detail in these three areas, we can uh, um, give you the expectations we have, for example, concerning training and competence of personnel. It should be, and it is not the first time that I mentioned, I, uh, that I mentioned this during this presentation, it should apply to all personnel working with animals. And there may be many different effective ways to uh, do this training and to evaluate the competence of personnel, but at least one essential thing, of course, is that uh, that system complies with applicable legislation. Okay. Concerning documentation or an example of issues identified uh, for documentation, one, these are just two examples. For example, we will expect that there is a clear evidence of IACUC or oversight body deliberations to demonstrate that they are really doing the job. Or for example, we will pay attention to the veterinary records, which is also sometimes an issue in some type of institutions. 
And also concerning the disaster plan, we will really evaluate, we will ask uh, to see normally the disaster plan when we are uh, at every institution. And uh, sometimes we find that even though there is a disaster plan, the disaster plan does not address the animal needs, which is something that it is not always well interpreted by some institutions. Uh, we have to focus or to design our disaster plan in a way that uh, it, it addresses animal needs, which may vary depending on the species we have or the type of disasters that we may be anticipating. It is not the same thing if we are uh, located in an area with potential hurricanes or with an area with potential snowstorms, et cetera, et cetera. Going into detail on the overall um, Ayacuc or equivalent uh, findings that we may identify during site visits, uh, we uh, distribute the findings in these uh, several categories. And we can see that in a percent of combined suggestions and man mandatory findings, just a, a short reminder that in ALAC terms, findings are categorized in mandatory findings that must be corrected to obtain the accreditation and suggestions for improvement, which are, I mean, the name, the name is self-explanatory. So uh, in a combined, uh, combining both um, type of findings, we see that the highest uh, number correspond to protocol considerations and to policies. Going into detail um, about protocol review consideration, what we sometimes find is that uh, there is not enough information on some of the protocols or projects which are evaluated on several key aspects that are to be evaluated, such as endpoints, how some procedures are conducted, how pain and distress are managed, etc. We would expect all institutions performing evaluation of uh, project, animal projects or protocols that all aspects are to be evaluated. And when I say all aspects, there are many different documents summarizing in a very similar way all the aspects, the guide for the current use of laboratory animals is one of them, summarizing all aspects that are expected to be evaluated. And in addition to that, a controversial concept, which is the harm benefit analysis. We expect institutions to perform such an analysis based on the information on the protocol or project research proposals. We even have a frequently asked question uh, where we uh, remind institutions of our expectations that that harm benefit analysis is conducted or that at least there, there is enough information in the, in, in the protocols or projects to allow the evaluation body to perform such an analysis. Because that is the key issue of the ethical review process. And what we would expect is that the review of research proposal is not limited to technical points such as how the anesthesia is conducted or other technical things. Concerning policies, I, I have uh, noted uh, the two most common, especially the first one, which is a policy on reporting animal welfare concerns. And this is something that we expect from institutions. So for, from institutions, we find sometimes that there are institutions, institutions not having such a policy, or even though uh, the policy exists, sometimes it is not anonymous, something to discuss in terms of uh, in legal terms in some countries that is true there are no uh, clear channels for communications in some cases or sometimes personnel are not trained on how to uh, report an animal welfare concern sometimes the policies are on paper but people do not know how to implement them and that's an important issue another of the typical um, issues that we may find is that in so in those institutions for example uh, where animals are reused routinely, uh, that sometimes we don't find a policy on reuse, which is, or reuse is not applied consistently, and people are, personnel are not trained on how to or when uh, reuse can be performed. With regard to responsibilities and, function, and functions of the, uh, of the IACUC or equivalent body, the main um, message that I would like to send is that we expect these bodies not to limit their activities to the prospective protocol or project evaluation. There are other aspects concerning ethical review that should be performed by such a body relating to oversight, 
implementation, general implementation of three R's in the institution, basically what we would expect is that that body helps uh, establishing a culture of care within the institution. And the main message is that these bodies should not be limited to prospective protocol or project evaluation. With regard to the way the protocol review pro, uh, uh, process is performed, uh, of course, we have to, um, to ensure that the process comply, complies with the applicable regulations. For example, in some cases, we can accept designated reviews instead of full committee reviews, depending on the circumstances that may be fine. And a very important point is that, as we have, we have discussed before, that there should be evidence of deliberations. That's the real proof that the, pro that the review process is taking, is taking place effectively. And as I said in the beginning of this slide, uh, ethical review is not just prospective protocol evaluation. One of the things that we expect institutions to do is what in the US is called post-approval monitoring of protocols. Okay? We even have a frequently asked question that I would encourage you to look at in our website concerning the post-approval monitoring uh, that should be performed according to uh, the protocol characteristics. Uh, we are not, let's say, requiring a specific frequency or system. They, it may depend on the severity of the procedures, the species used, et cetera. In any case, what we find at some institutions is that uh, IACUC or similar bodies in other countries evaluate prospectively the projects, but there is not a follow-up of how these projects are being performed in practice. And with regard to um, review of program and inspection of facilities, and again, with the concept we are uh, using of not just limiting the activity of such a body to the prospective evaluation, we, we think that these bodies also have to do an internal review of the program and the facilities. And again, with the same concept of um, not being um, uh, too prescriptive, uh, we are open to that. We have a frequently asked question as, as well that I would also encourage you to, to look at in our website. And basically, uh, even though this was very prescriptive in the tradition, in the former version of the guide, especially in the US, these things were called semi-annuals traditionally because it was expected that it, it should be performed semi-annually. We may accept different frequencies depending on the complexity of the program. It may be uh, different or require a more frequent uh, uh, review, those programs uh, housing more uh, complicated um, uh, or uh, sensitive species and more complex programs. And other important points is that we will try to see if those reports are submitted to the institutional official and that corrective actions are taken when deemed appropriate. Because what we see in some, in, in some instance, in some cases, is that those reports exist. Uh, sometimes those, re those reports are submitted to the institutional official, but there is no response or, not act or no actions are taken. With regard to composition and participation in this type of bodies, of course, we will have to ensure that the composition uh, complies with the applicable legislation, which may vary significantly across countries, across geographical regions, we may accept different ones. Uh, we will check that it is appropriate to the program complexity. Complying only with the minimum requirements in law may not be sufficient if the programs are complex. And a very important point is that we will pay attention to the potential conflicts of interest. For example, a very typical issue that we identify is that the institutional official is quite often a member of that committee and even in some cases, we find it that this person is the chair of the committee, which we think may, um, may be a potential conflict of interest because other members at the institution may be shy, let's say, to give their real opinions on particular issues. And also, sometimes uh, we may um, have some suggestions on the participation or lack of participation, I would say, of lay or external members in some of the committees. Basically, and summarizing uh, our expectations concerning the IACUC or the ethical review is that 
First, we have to ensure that because we cannot accredit institutions that uh, do not comply with the law, we will pay attention that the system complies with the law. That's something that institutions uh, have to, uh, to assure. Uh, but we may accept different systems based on institutional committees such as the North American IACOCs, government uh, systems which may be existing in some European countries, for example, or any kind of combination of both in many, uh, institu in many countries, many geographical areas, there is a combination and the ethical review process is, let's say, distributed between body or bodies or persons at institutional level and, and at government level. Basically, and this is the important thing, the outcome is what matters. So we will evaluate that the final outcome is appropriate, that it is also performance-based. And as I said before, maybe, maybe, uh, for example, using an example of composition of these committees, maybe just having the minimum composition by law may be legal, but not effective because of, because of the complexity of the program. So we will be evaluating that that composition or the actions are appropriate to the complexity of the program. Also, as mentioned before, we will pay attention to the independence and avoidance of conflict of interest during the ethical review process, re, re, during the ethical review process. And of course, that this is an important point which is missing in a number of cases that the IACUC or equivalent oversight body has the necessary authority within the institution. Moving now to the Occupational Health and Safety Program, I would like to address you to the position statement that it is on our website, which basically uh, states that the Occupational Health and Safety Program must be part of the overall animal care and use program, must be part. And that there is assurance that all personnel at risk are appropriately con con considered and it, sh it must be based on hazard identification, risk assessment, both related to the job and to the individuals, training of personnel, protection of staff, staff and written procedures and policies for hazard use and monitoring. Maybe the most important issue that we sometimes identify in institutions is that we see based or evidenced by a big number of findings of different nature within the Occupational Health and Safety Program, what sometimes we see is that there is not a coordinated Occupational Health and Safety Program, that there are a number of isolated actions in place, but there is not a, a real comprehensive program, organized program, which is the key issue, based on hazard identification and risk assessment. And this sometimes happens uh, because of the absence of occupational health and safety professionals. That is sometimes the issue. Sometimes we, persons in charge of animal facilities, small animal facilities especially, try to do everything on our own because we may lack some external support. Um, it may be uh, enough in some type of circumstances, but as the complexity of the program increases, also increases the need for, of, for the involvement of professionals on occupational health and safety. Going into detail, uh, I have distributed here both uh, uh, suggestions for improvement uh, or mandatory issues, but in both cases, you will see that with a big difference, the main issues relate to uh, personal protection and the rest to job uh, risk and safety assessment. Going into more detail, uh, maybe the most typical thing relates to poor, inconsistent, or even lack of personal protective equipment. In most cases, I would say relating to respiratory protection. The use of surgical masks is inconsistent or in between different areas, especially if there are uh, satellites in the institution. Uh, also concerning the dirty bedding dumping, very common in that area. And our expectation uh, is that, I mean, uh, the use of PPE is um, not bad. It is important and even essential and necessary in some instances. 
but we understand that it should be applied to supplement, <coughs> sorry, to supplement and not replace engineering controls. So as much as we can, we should be using engineering controls and on top of them, the appropriate PPE in a coordinated, consistent manner. Also important to note uh, the fit testing of respirators when they are used. Another of the typical uh, findings concerning occupational health and safety uh, relates to poor allergy prevention program. We also have a frequently asked question that you can find in our website. And again, for this, we would pay attention or would always recommend institution to apply first engineering controls and after that, the rest of the, uh, any protection. But also concerning allergy prevention program, the issue of the training is quite important. Personnel should be trained in the symptoms on how to detect them or, and when to do, or what, sorry, what to do in case they present these type of symptoms. Another very typical uh, finding, which normally lead, leads in many uh, occasions to a mandatory recommendation to the institution, is the safety in rug washers or and bulk, bulk sterilizers. We even have a position statement that we can see in our website. And basically, in addition to other uh, details, we will see that those uh, devices uh, provide ease of egress. Uh, also, a uh, de-energizing, either a stop of the flow of water or a stop of the sterilization uh, cycle in a bulk sterilizer mechanism and personal training, which is important. And this is an extremely, extremely important point for this and for many other issues in occupational health and safety or many others. It is not just a matter to have on site the resources, but the personnel must be trained to use them. Going to other um, very typical uh, findings uh, on occupational health and safety, we sometimes find lack of certification or maintenance of biosafety cabinets or other kind of safety devices, including, for example, anesthetic vaporizers. Sometimes we, we find that not all personnel are uh, under the occupational health and safety. Very typical people uh, laundry when there are still external laundries, people from maintenance services or visitors visiting the institution. And this is a, remind, a reminder of the text of the position st statement that you can read here. Other typical example is the inaccurate biohazard signage. Uh, signage, uh, biohazard signage should reflect actual hazards. It's very typical sometimes to go to institutions see a biosafety level two, sign in, an, in a room where no hazard is at all. So in the end, what, what happens is that people do not pay attention to all, uh, sorry, at all, to any of the uh, biohazard signage. Very typical also, uh, recape re needles, which we associate normally to a training issue. Uh, people, uh, this is a very typical, people should be trained not to recap needles unless mm, mm, ex extremely necessary. And very typical also the presence of unsecured gas cylinders. Well, going into the second big area of the animal care and use program, uh, the animal environment, housing and management, you will realize easily uh, with this graphic where uh, all uh, type of findings are uh, together that most relate to, to husbandry and sanitation, but maybe the most important ones because many of them are of a mandatory nature concerns behavioral and social management. So we will start with them and the typical, man, uh, typical findings that might be mandatory in some instances is that sometimes we find an in animals individually housed without justification. Sometimes some species or protocols, sometimes sentinel animals, etc. And with, relax, uh, with regard to uh, environmental enrichment, sometimes we see no environmental enrichment at all. But in some other circumstances, we see inconsistent implementation, maybe uh, not applied for certain procedures, it applies only for some species and not other social species, or sometimes it is left curiously at discretion of personnel without a consistent and a, uh, coordinated and agreed a program by all 
uh, per, by all players involved. With regard to social housing, I would recommend that you go to our position statement in our website, where we consider uh, social housing as the default method of housing. Default method of housing, unless justified by approved scientific necessity, social incompatibility, and veterinary concerns. And if justified, single housing should be limited to the minimum period and contact with conspecifics and additional enrichment should be provided. And very important, the policies and exceptions for single housing should be regularly reviewed and approved by the oversight body, by the IACUB, the Ethics Committee, the Animal Welfare Body, whatever it is called. This is a very important because sometimes um, we find institutions uh, very traditional in this sense, uh, having uh, the same policies for years and years and years when other institutions across the road have already evolved doing the same type of research, the same type of studies, and they have moved successfully from single housing to social housing. So in some cases, it may be difficult to defend when other institutions have made a change. So that's why the policies and exceptions for single housing should be regularly reviewed and updated if necessary. With regard to environmental enrichment, we have a frequently asked question basically that states that it should be part of an approved behavioral management program appropriate to the species, provided in a consistent manner across the whole animal program, consistent manner. It is not just a matter that we put every week whatever we find in our institution that's not consistent and may alter the research outcome. A personnel should be trained and uh, it should also take in account scientific goals, and that's essential because researchers should also be involved via, for example, the IACUC or oversight body in the review and approval and, let's say, acceptance of the environmental enrichment practices. With regard to cage pen space, uh, we also have a position statement that I would recommend you to see in our website. Basically, the three uh, key points is that it, it uh, Cage and pen space must comply with all national or regional regulations, policies, guidelines, as well as conditions of funding. It is true that we may find across the globe different um, regulations on minimum cage sizes, and you may find different uh, cages in accredited institutions, that's true. But we also will apply the performance standards. So once you have complied with the legislation, performance standards that are defined, you can find a number in the guide, even also a lot in the ETS 123 or the agricultural guide, uh, are expected also to be met. And very important, in those countries or geographical areas where no regulations on cage size uh, exist or are in place, the guide applies. Other uh, findings, uh, typical uh, real concerning micro and uh, micro and macro environment relate to excursions from temperature and humidity ranges. We will be expecting that temperature and humidity are at least monitored and controlled, at least in the case of temperature. We acknowledge that humidity is much more difficult to control so that we be, will pay attention to uh, extreme variations or, or to health um, problems uh, coming from um, big variations if they exist. Sometimes we find opaque, opaque cages. Um, they are not forbidden, of course, but uh, regardless of the type of cage you are using, we, we would pay attention if they allow for a proper observation of animals. And obviously with opaque cages that may be more difficult or involve more time. If you are using meshed floor, mesh, meshed floors in cages, we will see if a solid area for rest is provided, which is expected. We all know that uh, most species um, prefer other type of floors, solid floors. When you when you are using music, and this could be uh, uh, an example also on uh, of environmental enrichment, we expect that it is part of an approved program. Sometimes we find institutions with, with, a, with the best of the intentions, they are putting music, different music, different volumes, different rooms, uh, taking the music from one place to the other. And 
they and it is true that they may be thinking they are doing a nice thing but the use of music also may have some effects so that's why it, it should be part of an approved program reviewed by all with the input also of researchers sometimes we find places where uh, too much light uh, is given to animals or um, uh, animal rooms are illuminated too uh, too brightly and especially some animals albino animals may not be protected that's what we would expect that you pay attention to especially albino animals and um, not to use too bright lights and if at some moment they have to be used that animals are protected other typical uh, findings concerning husbandry poor food storage uh, control conditions uh, of lack of control conditions of food storage that we would expect. We expect that you don't, uh, that food is not stored in the same place that uh, food. Very typical storage in corridors, then you will have to pay attention to both uh, sanitation, problems of sanitation uh, given by storage in corridors and also of safety in, ca in case of emergency. Typical cases of overlapping clean and dirty materials. So what we would expect is that you avoid the risk of cross-contamination. And sometimes when you, in your uh, vermin control program, uh, we see when you are using rodent traps that you have uh, a, not a frequent observation of those rodent traps. And we have a, a frequently asked question that I would encourage you to, to look at that basically the key issue is that live mouse traps should be checked at least daily. We also are responsible of those uh, animals which are trapped in our rodent traps. And we have to ensure that they are not left uh, suffering uh, for a long period of, of time in those traps. With regard to sanitation, uh, one of the most common findings uh, in ALAC is the lack of monitoring lack of monitoring of the effectiveness of sanitation of anything, uh, cages, accessories, surfaces, etc. Sometimes we think that we are cleaning and we may not be cleaning unless, unless we check, we test the efficacy of our procedure. That's a very good example, very good example of our performance approach. We may accept many different ways of cleaning cages. We don't require a very modern automatic machine. Cages can be cleaned manually but what we will expect is that at the end of the, the process you have checked that the, your process is effective in satellites satellites make things complicated i know in some institutions and sometimes those satellites are not well controlled uh, when we would expect the same criteria than for the normal or traditional animal facility and things concerning the disaster plan we have already discussed in the beginning, sometimes we find that it, there is a lacking or that it does not focus on animal needs. And it has to be tailored to local situation and addressing particular animal needs. For example, if we have a surgical problem, what to do with animals in case of an emergency, if we are doing surgery. That could be an example. Well, go moving into the third big chapter in the veterinary care, uh, there are several uh, key issues concerning veterinary uh, authority. For example, uh, sometimes we find uh, concerning the, the authority of the veterinarian and the responsibility, sometimes we find a uh, weak veterinary oversight, insufficient veterinary authority, uncoordinated veterinary care in big institutions. Sometimes we find that the attending or designated veterinarians are non laboratory animal vets, that they don't have the training. In some type of institutions, we find that study directors may have more authority over animals than the veterinarians. In some institutions, the number of vets may be insufficient and very important, very um, significant is in some institutions when the veterinarian does not have access to animals. For the expectations on this, I would address you to the position statement on veterinary care where there are a number of musts applied to veterinary care responsible for what, for the well-being uh, authority resources experience training and expertise access to animals timely veterinary medical care at all times very important oversight of additional aspects and designated person when it is not full time and other shoots concerning communication with oversight body and institutional official. We have seen that already and uh, input on surgery programs and perioperative peri care. 
Going into more detail on veterinary care finding categories, we will see both as suggestions and mandatories that the most important, especially as a mandatory issue, is veterinary medical care, important, followed by, by euthanasia issues and very important as a mandatory pain and distress. Obviously, when pain and distress is not well managed, it has more chances to be a mandatory issue. Uh, findings and expectations, very important. Um, this is underlined because it may be very important. When we visit and when you visit, if you in your institutions uh, tour your facility and you see, observe sick animals that are not being attended, attended, that there is no evidence that they are being attended, uh, that's an important issue. And I would refer again to the position st statement uh, on, uh, on this. Uh, sometimes we see that there is a lack of backup for the attending veterinarian, especially in holidays. We expect that institutions assure veterinary attention at all times, at all times. I know that this may be difficult for small institutions, especially, but um, there may be some type of arrangements with external vets or uh, veterinarians working in other institutions that uh, can coordinate with you those uh, Labs. I, I understand that it may be difficult for um, small institutions having only one vet or even only one part-time vet. And the most common issue on veterinary care uh, chapter is relating to the CO2 euthanasia performed at most institutions, CO2 euthanasia, but in a number of them, not correctly. And I would encourage you to go to our frequently asked question that talks about the need of flow control, the use of an empty chamber, the competence of personnel, or for example, the confirmation of death. It is important that CO2 euthanasia follows those key issues, or sorry, those key um, uh, suggestions. Also very typical, the poor management of drugs, uh, the use of outdated drugs and mater or materials. Uh, sometimes uh, there is not a control of the access, etc., etc. Others relate to poor health monitoring, especially for non-rodent species. That's very typical for non-rodent species. Why many institutions apply very interesting, very good health monitoring programs for rodents, maybe because they are more easily available, but not for other species, for example, for farm animals. Very common, you go to an institution, rodents are very well taken care of, uh, farm animals are not subjected to a health monitoring program. Why? Or several fish or other species. We would expect that the same uh, impact that disease may have on rodents can also uh, be uh, on any other species. Also, we see poor inconsistent aseptic technique. We have even a frequently asked question uh, for those involved in surgical um, procedures. And very important, inappropriate anesthetic or analgesic regimes. Uh, and I will just summarize that the, prop, the, the key message here, which is the proper use of anesthetics and analgesics is an ethical and scientific imperative. So uh, that's a, a real important point. Going the last part, the uh, physical client uh, findings, uh, you can see uh, in red mandatory issues, in blue suggestions for improvement. And what very easily may catch your attention is that the 76% of mandatories and 57% of suggestions of, for improvement concerning physical plant relates to HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. That's a key area in, a, in an animal care and use program because it provides normally the appropriate environment, the necessary uh, appropriate environment to animals. Within the subcategories in HVAC findings, many of them concerns reporting of the uh, performance of the HVAC systems in places, environmental monitoring or excursions on temperature and humidity. Something that I would like to comment is that uh, institutions which are accredited are expected to communicate to us, uh, uh, to report to us anything concerning disasters that they have suffered. And if you see this graphic, it will cut your attention that a big majority of them concerns 
In the last year, 71% of all reported disasters concern physical plant issues. And when we go into detail, we will see that 74% of those belong to HVAC issues or other equipment malfunction. That's the important thing and something that we have to pay a lot of attention to our HVAC in our uh, facilities and to other type of equipment directly impacting animal well-being. Other typical physical plant, physical plant findings are uh, concerning deteriorated surfaces, the very typical uh, sailing floors whilst in a bad state of uh, maintenance, you win. I guess that everybody agrees on the uh, expectations we may have to for those that they are impervious, sealed, and uh, resistant. In the places where uh, there are satellites, uh, sometimes they are cluttered, they have sanitation concerns, there may be issues on lack of daily observations when, anim when animals are housed in those satellites. We expect the same principles for the satellites. Satellites do not impede a good program. They just make it more complex and satellites need special attention. Um, also, we may comment on the animal vulnerability in the event of a power interruption. So uh, we will pay attention to critical equipment and how uh, they are provided with a, with a backup power in case of a power failure. Other physical plant findings, poor security to access animal areas, lack of maintenance programs for diverse equipment. Uh, we have a frequently asked question on our expectations on the presence of windows in animal rooms, which may be fine, but it, it is expected to be reviewed and evaluated case by case because of the impact it may have on animals and therefore on research outcome. And very typical, yeah, uh, and that's why we have a frequently asked question, exposed pipes and that work in animal rooms. And that, that's very typical, for example, in some countries such as Germany, where many animal facilities are uh, having these pipes and that work exposed, which make sanitation more difficult, basically. And uh, issues concerning special facilities, cage washing, uh, sanitation areas, imaging suites, traffic of animals, uh, sometimes these imaging suites uh, are a risk of cross-contamination, so traffic patterns uh, are expected to be well evaluated. Storage areas we have already seen, uh, surgical suites, everything concerning uh, preparation, ensuring aseptic, aseptic technique. Uh, as a short summary, uh, and going my last couple of minutes in a more philosophical way, I would say, we live in, uh, in, a, in a world, in the lab animal world, in, uh, we, have, we live under a number of regulations across different countries that um, establish the legal standards that may be uh, different in different countries. They may share uh, some areas, but there may be different in, in the way they are implemented. At the same time, we have a lot of professional work, guidelines, recommendations that more based uh, that fortunately up to some extent are taken in consideration when for some by some regulators when producing legal standards, but at, 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 at the same time produce based on science, on publications, on, on research work, best practice and other type of standards which are in, in many cases well beyond what it is expected by, by uh, legal standards. So using this same scheme, uh, I would say that legal standards that are for corners, legal standards are closer to engineering standards normally, while these other standards most based on science are closer to performance standards. And altogether, they frame the way we have to work at our institution. They frame how we have to, uh, to do and to work within our animal care and how to, we, we have to establish our animal care and use programs. And normally, normally we will have to use this area to work, that area where uh, we um, put together some of the, the legal standards that we have to comply with and some of those engineering standards with as much of the uh, other good standards, practices and performance standards which are given by science 
and best practice. And what we are trying to do in ALAC, and I would recommend you do as much as you can, is that you move in that direction. Because science and um, performance standards and best practice goes or moves faster than legal standards. We have to comply with the legal standards, but somehow we have to move in the right direction, trying to improve our animal care and use programs. And again, I know that uh, all of these things are more easily said than done. I perfectly know that. Uh, but if you want to improve your existing program, if you want to especially establish a new one uh, from a non-well-coordinated situation, take the first step. Um, that's the hardest part of any journey, of any journey, which is taking that first step. If you don't take the first step, you don't, you will not reach uh, the end. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Guillen, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Guillen will answer as many questions as time permits. And the first question is, please give examples of how IACUC can evaluate if the investigators have performed benefit harm analyses. I think, in quotes, justification for animal use can fulfill this. I think it is the IACUC or equivalent. I think it is the um, IACUC or the uh, oversight body, the one who is going to evaluate if, uh, and to do that harm benefit analysis, analysis more than the researcher, him or herself. It is a matter that, um, it is a, um, a matter of evaluating all the aspects that potentially can cause any pain, any pain or distress in the animals with the potential benefits you can obtain. It is true that it is an extremely complex process. And in many of the cases, there is not a well-defined process to do that. Uh, um, normally, it is done based on the information and the pro protocol or project evaluation, but there may be, and there have been several attempts to create uh, some um, uh, ways of processes of doing, of doing it qualitative or quantitative. Uh, it's quite complex. Uh, I am involved in, uh, um, in uh, ALAS FELASA working group, and uh, we have produced a manuscript that it is in the process of publication. I hope it will be published this year, where we are uh, proposing a way to do that based on a number of items that can be uh, listed as potential uh, harm, let's say, issues, and other items that can be uh, listed as benefit issues. And given a kind of category, in our case, in terms of colors, for example, in the end, you will get a, a certain idea if that process of, or, or if the, um, if the uh, benefits outweigh uh, the harms. It is a very complex issue, I acknowledge. We have an FAQ that will not give you details on how to do it. We will expect that somehow you are considering, because in fact, harm benefit is the key issue of the ethical evaluation. Once it is the first thing to do, once you have decided that, uh, uh, that, that it, is, it is ethically acceptable to use those animals for that thing, then you go into the technical details. But how to do it? Uh, difficult. There, are some there is some literature to that respect, and I would recommend you wait until the publication of this report, which may give you another, uh, an idea on uh, the approach to be taken. And, um, well, it seems that we are um, running... I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions not answered today can be sent to Dr. Guillen's email address. As a reminder, this presentation has been approved for continuing educational credits. If you want to obtain the credits, please click on the Get Your Free CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of our speakers and presentations. 
Please select the CE button under the presentation and follow the instructions to claim your certificate. This webcast will be viewed on demand through August 3rd, 2016. LabRoots will be alerting you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.